two-handed presentation. We're going to see if I can hold a microphone in one hand and I can actually look my notes because I've written some stuff for you and it relates to everything that you've just seen. The importance of taking care of the planet, the importance of taking care of our environment, and at the same time the importance of not being obsessed and of correctly interpreting things. David Bohm, the physicist, um, said that you can have all the right mathematics in a theory, but if you get the metaphor that explains why the math works wrong, you get everything. And that, in essence, is what we've been doing with our interpretation of nature, with our interpretation of our place in the cosmos. Um, and the Stephen Hawking quotes, the William Burroughs quotes, I think they're very much on target. I wrote some stuff for you, specifically for you, and um, I want to read them if I can operate this gadget uh, with a hand. But that's not free here. Hang on a second. It says, well, first of all, the underlying message is that every poison is a paradise in waiting. Every wasteland is a potential paradise. Um, to give you an example before I go into this, once upon a time, between one billion and two billion years ago, there was a massive catastrophe. We had the first life forms on this planet. They came together approximately four billion years ago when this planet was still in its early stages of formation. That means that planetesimals, giant hunks of rock, were smacking the face of this planet as if it were silly putty, um, as if it were a pudding, a gelatin. And the first life forms came together under these conditions. They had a tremendous challenge ahead of them. Initially, at some point, and it probably took a lot of evolution, there was a total of one teaspoon of biomass on the face of this planet. That was approximately 3.85 billion years ago. And life was the very first project to be ambitious. Stars, yes, they're ambitious. They swallow as many other things as they can. You just saw a binary star in which one star is busy sucking the material off of another star. Stars are highly competitive. Stars get to be what they are by competing, by swallowing other things, until they become so big that they tear apart the atoms at their heart. And the screens of those atoms are photons. The screens of those atoms are the first life. So stars are competitive and stars are hierarchical. If you're a ball of matter somewhere in the vicinity of a sun, of a, of a newborn star, you have two choices, you have three choices. Um, you can compromise, and if you work out the right compromise, you can retain your identity. How? By circling the sun. Or you can fail to compromise. And if you fail to compromise, in all probability, you will be swallowed whole. And your very atoms will become part of what is being torn apart, leading to those screens of light. So, hierarchy. After all, the sun dominates a solar system, and other things simply circle around it. Um, that is a hierarchy. Hierarchy and competition, these are not unique things to life. The unique thing to life is ambition. And that first little puddle of matter, one teaspoonful in size, had a life and death problem ahead of it. Here we have macromolecules that consist of three billion atoms Three million atoms, sorry. Three million atoms each. Really, really big teams of atoms. And they're in a universe that smacks atoms apart. What do stars do? They tear atoms apart. What does ultraviolet light do? It smacks atoms apart. What do gamma rays do? They smack the atoms in a molecule apart. Your job, if you were part of the early life, is to kidnap, seduce, and recruit as many inanimate atoms as you possibly can and bring them into this awesome project. This project that starts as nothing but has incredible ambitions. And its ambitions are to green the planet. Why? Because nature is very different than we think. In 1972, I believe it was, the Club of Rome issued a report on the limits to growth. And that report has been incredibly influential. John Holdren, who is currently the science advisor to President Obama, 
comes from the school, Paul Ehrlich School, the Limits to Growth School. The Limits to Growth School is bullshit. It's got nature and our place in nature all wrong. It has taken four billion years, but life has finally gone from a teaspoonful to five trillion tons of biomatter. Now that sounds very substantial, right? A lot of life. It is very insubstantial. Because for every pound of biomatter on the face of this planet, there are a hundred million pounds of inanimate matter that has not yet been kidnapped, seduced, or recruited into the grand plan of life. And we say we're running out of resources? Are we crazy? Um, okay, so once upon a time, about two billion years into the process of life, we had cyanobacteria were the dominant forms of life. Bacteria live in big colonies. These colonies are very sophisticated. They're colonies, a colony the size of my hand. Ted, that's a, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, yes, that's a, that's a credit to the hand. But, okay. <laughs> A colony the size of my hand has seven trillion bacteria. That's more than all the humans who have ever lived on the surface of this planet. And they are all communicating with each other. They are smart as the dickens. And they are adaptive mechanisms. And they, when they run into an obstacle, they communicate it to each other. When they run into a wasteland, they communicate it to each other. When they run into food, they communicate it to each other. This is a giant communicative life form. It has a problem. It has learned to kidnap, seduce, and recruit inanimate atoms. And it has learned what kinds of inanimate atoms it can digest. It's developed a metabolism, and metabolism is an incredible invention. It takes all kinds of atoms that seem like dead stuff and turns them into energy and turns them into biomass. That's astonishing. But metabolisms are limited. There are only some things that they can absorb. And what they can't absorb, what they can't process, what they haven't yet learned to turn into biomass and energy, they excrete. And those things are, by definition, a poison. So these little bacteria, cyanobacteria, living in colonies of seven trillion, ate what they could, and their eating was a brilliant proposition in terms of trans translating this planet into life. But what they couldn't, they farted out. <laughs> Now, a little tiny fart from a bacteria so small, a bacteria so small we cannot see it, doesn't count for much in an enormous ocean. It doesn't count for much in an enormous atmosphere. But after two billion years, these cyanobacteria had polluted the atmosphere of their planet. They had poured so much poison into the atmosphere that it built up. And there was a massive, massive, die off, at least according to Lynn Margulis, who's the biologist who's primarily responsible for this scenario, and who I'm lucky enough, she, she is kind enough to be a fan of mine. Um, the great die off called for an incredible act of creativity. The solution to the die off wasn't to get rid of the toxin in the atmosphere, it was to learn how to use it as food and fuel. It was to learn how to turn it into biomass. Every poison is an opportunity waiting to happen. Carbon dioxide is one of the greatest opportunities I've ever seen in my life because that's what our fuels are made of. Carbon, oxygen. Okay, back to the bacteria. What did they do? Some very tiny bacteria came up with a way to metabolize the poison and turn it into energy. The larger bacteria could not do that. So they made a deal with the smaller bacteria. You live inside of me. You process the oxygen into food and fuel I can use. I will give you a home. I will make sure you have constant food. I will make sure that you do not need to defend yourselves. I will defend you. I will make sure that I take you to those zones on the planet that have the most stuff that you really like to eat. The deal was made and the result is the cells of which you and I are made. Because those cells have what are called organelles. And the organelles include the mitochondria. And the mitochondria are our 
ovens. They are our furnaces. They are the part of our metabolism that takes the poison and turns it into the energy that runs us. And do you know what the poison was that resulted in a mass die-off? Are you ready? It's called oxygen. The stuff we find absolutely indispensable was the poison. We are here because of the power of previous life forms, our ancestors, to take toxic waste and turn it into an opportunity. So that's really what our life here on the planet is all about. For one thing, the, planet, the, the Club of Rome people predicted that by 1980, we would have overpopulated the planet so badly that we would be running, running out of food, there would be starvation all over the place, and there wouldn't be enough room for us. We would have to stand on each other's shoulders. This was the prediction of a very highly prestigious scientific group, very similar to the highly prestigious scientific group that is telling us about global warming. Now, I am not here to tell you that the people who talk about global warming is wrong. I am here to tell you that the way they interpret global warming is wrong. And that's where what I wrote for you comes in. Let me see if I can read it. Hang on. Um, okay, it says, breaking, uh, first of all, this talk is called Breaking the Bubble of Spaceship Earth. <laughs> Welcome to Breaking the Bubble of Spaceship Earth. And here's what I wrote for you. It is time to stop a plague. A plague of perception. We believe the Earth is a prison. A prison for us and a prison for life. We call that prison Spaceship Earth, but it is a prison whose bars we have fashioned. Earth is not a prison. It is a nest. It is a starting place. It is a jumping off point. For what? For everything green and glorious. For ecosystems. For life. Now look, we share this planet with some super smart organisms. Those bacteria do research and development today. Those bacteria descended from our ancestors who kept the bacterial form, do research and development so fast that our medical establishment, which is now huge and extremely well-funded, has a very difficult time staying ahead of them. Not only does it have a very difficult time staying ahead of them, arguably the only thing that our doctors really do for us, but let, what do our doctors do for us? In 1850, we lived to an average of 38.5 years. Today, we live to an average of 78.5 years. Our lifespan is double. That means every one of you and me, we have all been given an extra fucking lifetime. My lecture agent is here, and he told me not to swear. Oh well, say la vie. Another tape spoiled. Um, okay, where were we? Um, second life. Let's say, well, we've got a second life. The question is, do we get it from the medical establishment? There is one thing that is argue, I mean, arguably we don't. Arguably we get it from the Industrial Revolution. Arguably we get it from gadgets like this and this that allow us to extend our powers in ways that are utterly beyond belief because go to your doctor and usually he doesn't have a clue as to what's wrong with you. And he only has a very small number of pills to give you, but the most effective pills and the ones that have definitely helped and extending human life. Those are antibiotics. Now here we are in a race with bacteria, some of whom defend us. We have huge colonies of bacteria living in our skin, living in our mouth, living in our throat, who do nothing but defend us. Of course, in exchange, we give them food and housing. In fact, we walk around looking for food they can eat. The bacteria in our gut digest a good part of the food for us. They make our vitamin B, our vitamin P, and our vitamin K. We can't make them without them. We have a deal very similar to the deal our cells make with mitochondria. I will walk around as a giant munching machine. I will walk around as a giant search device. I will find you chocolate eclairs and everything else that you love to eat. I will feed them to you. You will eat them. You will excrete what you find to be a poison. And what you find to be a poison is mana for me. That's the stuff I live on, for God's sakes. So, Arguably, the medical establishment has only done for us antibiotics. And what are antibiotics? Here we are competing with bacteria. Bacteria make war. We did not invent war any more than we invented hierarchy and competition. When they make war, they use weapons of mass destruction. 
They use chemical weapons. Weapons designed for genocide. Weapons designed to wipe out entire rival colonies of seven trillion individuals. Where did we get our antibiotics? They're weapons of mass destruction. We simply stole the chemistry of their weapons of mass destruction and found ways to reproduce them. That's it, so we're dependent on bacteria even for the most important thing that medical science has given us. But the big point is this, the Club of Rome did not get it right about nature. They thought nature is wonderful and green. They thought nature gives us gardens of Eden. They thought nature gives us a paradise. Nature is bloody as a bloody bitch. Nature allows us to make paradises, but she challenges us to make paradises. She challenges us to make paradises. She does not make paradises. If you leave nature alone and take the carbon out of the atmosphere and stop mistreating nature and you become like the uh, indigenous peoples and you worship nature, nature is not going to turn green and lovely. There have been, and this is another problem that that initial teaspoon of life was up against, there have been 142 mass extinctions on the face of this planet. None of them were caused by smokestack gases. None of them were caused by tailpipe emissions. Even the person we saw in his TED talk a few minutes ago, who was talking about the importance of getting rid of the acidification of the ocean, stopping the acidification of the ocean, showed you charts and diagrams in which he showed you incredible variation on this planet in the climate that preceded anything that we've accomplished. So nature knocks life around and challenges it. Nature says, I'm going to give you the latest in my bag of tricks. I'm going to threaten you with utter and complete extinction. If you haven't learned enough ways to adapt to change, you will be gone. You will be out of the game. Your job, if you choose to accept it, is to adapt to change. Your job, if you choose to accept it, is to overcome change. Your job, if you choose to accept it, is when I, nature, throw you an ice age, you learn to live on the edge of the glaciers and glory in it. And that is exactly what the human family did in Europe during the ice ages. In the last two million years, there have been 60 glaciations. That's what made us human, adapting to the change of those glaciations. And that is what we need to continue to do today, and that is where space comes in. Because we do not live in a universe of limited resources. Not at all. Not only are there 200 or 100 million pounds of unprocessed stuff that hasn't been turned into life for every pound of life on this planet, the resources of a million Earths a million Earths, and that's an understatement, are out there waiting for us. And bacteria are better than we are at research and development in many ways. But the fact is, we're the only life forms that can get life outside the gravity well. We're the only life forms that can take ecosystems the eight and a half minutes it takes to get above our heads, to get beyond the atmosphere of this planet. We are the saviors and the spreaders of life. And if we accept that mission, we will do something magnificent and glorious. If we turn it down because we think we're living in a prison, a spaceship Earth, we will be doing an enormous disservice to nature who made us, an enormous disservice to change, an enormous disservice to life. Mm -hmm.